Hi everybody, in this hopefully shorter video, I wanna go over 10 tips for D5 users. These will apply to new users, as well as those who've got a bit more experience with D5. And what I'm hoping to do is do 10 tips in 10 minutes. All right, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. And let's do tip number one. The first thing you need to know about is navigation. By default, D5 is set to the orbit navigation type. This means the right mouse button is actually gonna spin you around your scene, and we can move in with the basically the scroll wheel. Now, it also means that the WASD and the Q and E keys are actually disabled. So the first piece of advice, if you want to navigate around D5 in a more fluent fashion, and more consistent with a lot of other rendering programs out there, go up here, click on the little icon, navigation, and change this to fly. When you do that, it will allow you to use the W, ASD keys to move forward and back, Q and E to move up and down, and you also have controls for the actual speed of the fly. So you can actually move a lot faster around your scene. You can also, if you wanna do effectively kind of, uh, what we call this vertical photos or vertical renders, we can go ahead and tweak that right here as well. But for the most part, it's good to just be able to move around a lot faster. All right, tip number two pertains to scenes and the camera changes. So we're probably familiar with going up here to the scene list, and this is where we can add a scene. So for example, clicking this button right here, add scene, we'll add a new one called scene two. Now, the thing to note about this, by default, if we click on these three little dots, you'll see camera switch only. What that means is, even though you set up different scenes, and perhaps you try and change the lighting in one to a different lighting, when you click on your scene, it will always revert back to the default environment lighting. However, if we toggle this camera switch only off, you can see now we can have really different scenes. So scene two has got very different lighting right now to scene one. And so if you wanna export a variety of different kind of visual scenes, you don't necessarily have to do that completely. You can keep the camera angle the exact same, but all you have to do is change the camera switch only and you can change the environment. On to tip number three. You're probably aware of the layers panel over here on the left. You can use the plus to add extra layers. So for example, this layer maybe has got different decorations than on the default layer, but you may not realize you can right click on these layers and rename them. So for example, I'm gonna rename this to foliage and click enter. And once I turn this on, I can then go to my assets tab, go to models, go to nature, and I'm going to just put in a shrub for some reason, because why not? And let's just quickly download this one. And I'm going to just hold down, uh, let me see the C key, and just place that on the table. And you can see now, if I go back to my default layer, I can toggle foliage on and off. Now, a lot of people will use layers, but they may not realize that you can rename them. And it's a really handy way to keep track of what's going on on your layer content. For example, urban scenes, you may decide to put the foliage, the trees, but also maybe vehicles or people on their own specific layer and only toggle this on when you're about to render. It's really handy and it's often forgotten about. On to tip number four, and this one pertains to the object menu over here on the bottom left. So everything in your scene is going to appear in the object menu, and you can also click on the imported tab to show objects that you may have imported from another program. And you can actually have objects in the scene from a variety of different sources all at the same time in D5, which is pretty cool. But one thing to note about this is it's kind of a little bit messy things just appear in. So if we click on this icon right here, which is the little dots, you can actually filter by object type. Now, one thing to note about this, I've gone ahead and filtered by object light. And for example, I can now go in here and I can increase the intensity of this light. Maybe I can change the color. But one thing DD5 doesn't tend to tell you is filtering 
also locks out the selecting of anything else. So for example, I cannot click on any other object in my scene. And so please keep this in mind. This is a source of like incredible frustration for me uh, early on. The reason is by isolating the object type, you lock the selection. Now, one really cool thing about the lights here that I do want to mention as well is that the lights in D5, you can actually rename them. So here I've gone ahead and just right clicked and hit rename. So we can do spotlight C7, right click and rename. And you can type in whatever you want. And again, you may not use this all the time, but it can be incredibly useful knowing what light is targeted to what specific area of your scene. Are they ceiling spotlights or are they lamp lights? And this can get really, really kind of uh, a little bit messy if you don't go ahead and name your lights. So just when in doubt, right click and just rename them. You can also select lights here and right click and group them as well. And that will make toggling lights on and off a little bit easier. All right, moving on. Let's bounce over here to one of our objects. And I'm gonna maybe just select this table. Why not? And if you actually do by left clicking on an object in D5, you can see that the inspector will open up here. Now, one thing about this is we often think of the inspector as just showing basic information. You can move objects around and you can maybe lift them up and down. But what if you're in a situation where you have an object that doesn't exactly fit the scene exactly how you want it to? Let's look at this chair right here. I'm gonna left click on it. And if I hit V to scale this, and I wanna scale it up a little bit or maybe make it wider, you can kinda of see you're actually scaling it universally. But over here on the right, on the inspector, you can see there is a size button. I'm gonna click on, click this, and now you can actually go in here and scale objects on the specific axis that you want to use, which is really, really useful. You'll have noticed there is a download period, and this can be really long for some of the more intense objects. But what if you actually wanted to just keep them locally so things were a little bit faster? Well, you can. I'm gonna select um, this really adorable wolf, or try to, there we go. Hit uh, V on the keyboard, and I'm gonna just move our wolf out of our room. Okay, I'm gonna place it right here. I'm gonna get the camera really close, and just because this guy's adorable, let's go ahead and just rotate just a little bit. And what I'm going to do now is over here in the object tab, right click and add to local. Okay, now the reason we'll do this is quite simply, local storage will be faster to access than downloading your assets every time. Hit M on the keyboard, go to local, and there is our little gray wolf. And I can just plop him into my scene. And that is a really, really fast way to utilize your favorite assets without having to re-download them every time. All right, the next tip is also back to lights. And one of the problems when you're working with D5 is visualizing your lights. What happens if you kind of set up a lighting system, but you're not really sure what it's actually doing to your scene? How can we actually see our lights? Well, a quick way to do that, go up to display, and you can see we've got options for mode. By default, we're in the lit mode, which is basically the real time, but we can also click on this one here, the clay model. Now, you can see here, especially if we go to environment and we put this to night, you're gonna be able to see the effect that your lights are having in your scene. And especially if I turn off my two area lights that are lighting up the roof, now you can see more specifically the effect that each of these lights is having in your scene. In fact, it's a really efficient way to visualize the color changes and the strength and fall off of your actual lights. On to tip number eight. And if you're struggling to set up your camera shots and you're not sure if what's in focus or what the camera is looking at is really good, well, it's really handy that D5 does under the display tab have a grid. Now this grid is going to give you a nice rule of thirds. You can see these white lines will intersect and these four points are basically areas of visual interest. 
Using this rule of thirds grid will also help in just the arrangement of your actual scene. Tip number nine, working with decals. So one of the benefits of working in D5 is access to the decals. We hit M on our keyboard. We can go to the asset library. I'm gonna go down all the way down here to where it says decals, and I'm gonna load these up. Now, you can see there's a whole bunch of them that come in pretty much by standard with D5. If you want to, for example, put a manhole cover in your actual room, you can totally do that. One of the best uses though is adding wear and tear to your surfaces, particularly walls, but also adding things like smudges to tables to give them a more organic look. So for example, let's add this uh, water stain right here. And I'm gonna just download it and place it on my table. And you can see it looks pretty good. The question is though, what if you wanted to change out your decal? What instead you wanna change this water stain to something a little different? and something more unique. Well, you actually can. And if you approach this from the point of view as each decal is just a material, and for example, we can go over to the right here. I'm gonna move myself out of the way. You can see the only thing that makes a decal actually really a decal is this, the actual opacity map, which is a black and white image that comes with really the decals built in. So let's go ahead and change the base color. If you want to, for example, let's click the base color map and I'm going to manually load one up. And here I am in my mega scans. So I need to grab my albedo, load it into the albedo slot, my normal, load it into the normal slot. And we're gonna do this for roughness as well. And opacity, let's grab the uh, mega scans opacity. Now you can see here, if we lift this up, what we have is now a decal. The difference is the base color is still black. I'm gonna change that to white. And now you can see if you want your table to look like it's covered in blood splatter, well, now you can. There is a tendency for new people in particular when they're starting out in visualization to want to make really dramatic shots. So we have a tendency to go down here and I'm going to click on the plus box. I'm gonna add a camera and then I'm gonna move the camera to whatever I want in focus. And maybe I'm going to turn off, uh, let me sh make sure depth of field is off. Then I'm gonna add another camera. And then maybe I wanna focus on this, so I'll add another camera. And you can see what kind of happens is the videos themselves start to become really long, really drawn out, and there's too much happening. The camera is kind of moving all over the place and now it's doing kind of a pivot shot and spinning. There is a better way to do this and it comes down to the use of clips. Just go down here and add other clips. So if, for example, we wanna start another shot up here, just add clip number two and we can maybe pull our camera back here and add another one. We can also then choose to maybe focus on different things by adding another clip and adding another camera and maybe doing something similar. Maybe we move forward this time and we add another camera. The benefit of this approach is that by using a clip-based approach, you have more control, you waste a lot less time rendering because the camera is not moving all over the shot. It's also more visually appealing. Quite simply, when it comes to doing any video stuff on any type of rendering, you really want to minimize the amount of camera movement, particularly the amount of camera sway that happens and very much kind of limit the clip length. Nobody needs to see an entire, you know, flying over magic video. Just keep it simple, keep it base forward and keep the clips relatively short. They will work a lot better stitched together than one really long camera shot. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.